The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back. Golenbach University. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And the professor is here. Alan Blumkin is here, the third baseball Meshuggana. And <laughs> we have a guest returning to the airwaves, a fellow podcaster with um, his own podcast show on the Dodgers on this network. Um, I'd like to welcome Ron Rabinovitz. Hi, Ralph. How are you? Good to be back. Good. How are you? Um, good. Peter, Great. Um, how are you doing? Doing fine, thank you. Good. And Al Blumkin, Sabre. No, up until Star. about half an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> the Steelers. Uh, I, um, I'm out of the football business um, of late. I've devoted all my time You're lucky. energy to, to You're lucky. baseball. But you missed one of the amazing football games that we've seen in a long, long time. The Pittsburgh well, Steelers it, I against do New keep England. up enough to know that the Niners have a quarterback. Yeah, they won. They won again today. They won. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, my, the Vikings won too. No. The Vikings yeah, won too. But they were zero with nine. Yeah, the Vikings are uh, probably right now with uh, with uh, uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia's quarterback once being out, the Vikings are probably the best. Best team yeah. in the uh, NFC at this point. Yeah, right. That's right. Wow. Well, that's. Uh, can you, can you imagine? You know, the, the Super Bowl is in Minneapolis. Yeah, I'm sure all the media people were thrilled by that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, um, amazingly enough, what we're going to talk about is a uh, Wisconsin team, um, the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, fascinating wow. to me, as I was talking with Ron off the air a little bit, in all their existence, they never had a losing season. Right. And you, you want, believe Ralph, that. you want the flip side of that? In all 13 Kansas years that the A's were in Kansas City, they never had a winning season. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. how some franchises uh, yeah. <laughs> go. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I grew up in Wisconsin, Ralph. Okay. Uh, in Sheboygan, which is about 50 miles from Milwaukee. So it was very, very exciting when the Braves moved from Boston to Milwaukee. And although I wasn't now, a Braves fan... This is before your Dr. Jackie Dr. Robinson rooting days. Well, no, it wasn't, because I met uh, Jackie in 1953 oh, the when, the Dodgers, when the Dodgers were playing the Braves. That was the first year. And uh. then, of course... Uh, I met him in 54 and 55 and 56, and I went to the World Series in 57. So it was very exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. No uh, no place in your heart for the Braves at all, though? Well, I was so much for the Dodgers, you know, that uh, except when the, when the Dodgers were out and the Braves could win, like in 57 and 58, then I would cheer for them. Because okay. I was a National League fan all the way. Let's ask the professor about the two years that the Yankees played the Braves, 57 and 58. Um, they were your Yankees at that time. They were uh, indeed. It was very interesting because Mine too, was yeah. from <laughs> Wisconsin, and um, there was all kinds of controversy when the Braves came in, it was like Bushville, Casey was saying. And, um, Peter, your your memories of those days? Well, the Braves had a, a very fine ball club. You know, they mm -hmm. had Eddie Matthews, who's in the Hall of Fame. He was their third baseman. Uh, Red Shainzines, his second base. They had Henry Aaron, who's, um, I, I can't tell you how, how marvelous he is. And they had Warren Spahn. Uh, Lou Burdett, Bob Ewell, and they had my favorite player, Gene Conley. Gene Conley, a big six foot nine or six foot eight. He was also a Boston Red Sox and a Boston right. Celtic. Right. So, so backed up Bill Russell. He backed up Bill Russell for years. He did. Yeah. He yeah. did. And uh, 
Milwaukee won the World Series in in 57, and they were going to win the World Series in 58, but the Yankees ran the table at the end and and, and finally aced them out, which was which was rewarding for me as a Yankee fan. Yeah, me too. That was revenge. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys mentioned Gene Conley, and he and Pumpsy Green almost went to Israel. They got well, off a, a bus. Go. There's a story. <laughs> there's, there's a whole story behind that. Um, Is there? Yeah, Conley. Conley told it to me in in, in the Fenway book. Uh, he was kind Love enough. Love to hear it. A lovely, lovely man, Gene Conley. Wonderful, wonderful fella. And the thing that people didn't realize about him is that he never had a day off. So that um, when the baseball season ended, he would go directly and start playing basketball. So he never had vacations. He, he was playing professional sports 12 months a year, just about. Wow. And the, wow. the fact of the matter is, you know, they, they weren't being paid very, very much money. He was no. probably making, I'm guessing now, he's probably making, you know, $17,000 as a pitcher um, for the Braves and probably making another 15000 as as a backup for, uh, you know, for Russell. So it's not like they are today when you're making, you know, $18 million as a mm -hmm. relief pitcher. It's, it's It was totally right. different back then. Totally. So, right. Some, somebody so, posted that he was... Uh, the other day on Facebook, that he was trading even up for Frank Sullivan, and it's the tallest trade in the history of baseball. Ah, that's great. <laughs> that is just terrific. <laughs> but but they they had played a game at Yankee Stadium, and they had gotten beat, I believe. And so the Red Sox bus was traveling from the stadium, uh, was heading out the Lincoln Tunnel, and was in tremendous tremendous traffic. Huh. And so. Connolly, whose nerves were really shot, because again he hadn't had a vacation and he was just feeling it. He said to Pumpsy, "Hey, let's go into this bar from the bus. You could see there was a bar nearby. Let's go into this bar and have a drink." And so, for reasons that Pumpsy can't really explain, he decided, "Okay, what the hell? I'll go with him." And so they went. And while they went, <laughs> of course, the bus kept going. You know, leaving them behind. Uh, at which point, Conley came up with the idea. Uh, he was really having a nervous breakdown. That's really what he told me was happening. He came up with the idea is he wanted to go to Jerusalem and see Jesus. Is really what it was. Yeah. And and so he and he and Pumpsy went to um, went to the airport, Idlewild Airport at the time, and uh, you know wanted to buy a ticket from New York to Jerusalem. Uh, the only problem, of course, you might guess, is they did not have their passports with them. And without the passports, without the passports, they couldn't go. And so, so Pumpsy, who was not having a nervous breakdown, he was a little, you know, saner than Gene at that point, decided he'd better get on the train and head back to, you know, wherever the next game was and, and meet up with the Sox, which, which is what he did. Conley took, he was a pitcher. Conley, being a pitcher, you know, wasn't going to pitch for another four or five days, so he could take a few days off, and, you know, they'd find him 100 bucks and nobody would care. Um, and, and so he went, you know, I guess he drank for a couple of days, and, 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 you know, finally he rejoined the team, and when everybody wanted to know where he was, he told this story about how he was trying to fly to Jerusalem to see Jesus. And, and the interesting thing about Connolly, of course, is that he was such a marvelous athlete. The fact that he was right. one of the, you know, four or five people who could play two professional sports. Right. That right. when you talk about Connolly, the thing that people remember most about him was his was his failed trip to Jerusalem. Exactly. <laughs> there was a story and that I'm that, learning that, something right now. I thought his intentions in going to Israel were along the lines of a judical. Uh, a Jewish um, calling of of some sort. I, as a kid, I had no idea that there are three major religions that have that same holy land 
as a as a goal, or, you know, the Christians and the Arabs, and, and that never even occurred to me. I thought he, he's gone to Israel to to go to the Wailing Wall, and <laughs> to be honest with you, I never put the Christian thing together until this conversation. So, um, and this is fifty <laughs> years later. That's uh, <laughs> there was a story that Dick Grohl told me regarding Conley. Uh, when Dick Rowe came out of the army, he went in to see uh, Mr. Ricky. Uh, he went, you know, Dick Rowe played uh, 26 games for the 54, 53, 253 Pistons. He wanted to play both sports. You know, he had been an All American right. basketball player at Duke, and he uh, said, "Well, Gene, cut the, well, R- R- Ricky said you can't do both." And uh, wait, wait, why is he talking to Ricky? Rowe Ro- Ro- was, Ro- was on the Pirates. Ricky was a pirate GM. Oh, pirate general manager. Pirate, oh, yeah, Ricky was a pirate. Yeah, this was pirate. Pirate. the beginning of 1955. And, oh, I see. Right, right. Uh, Grove wanted to play both sports, and Ricky said, no, you can't do it. Uh, he's, and, he's, and so uh, Dick Grove told me he brought up Gene Conley as an example. He said, you're not going to be like Conley. You're going to play 150 games a year for us. And if you play for them, you're going to play 40, uh, 40 minutes a game for them. You know, even though the seasons at that, that time didn't overlap, uh-huh. he said, you can't do that. So he took base. The growth told me he chose baseball because uh-huh. the money was better. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting story. Very that interesting. is interesting. Yeah. yeah. There's you know, the, great... Braves, the Braves had an ABC outfield. Aaron Bruton and Covington. Mm-hmm. ABC. Right. Yeah, they sure did. And they brought in a guy named Andy Pasco, a former right. Dodger. Yeah, and they got right. they got Joe Adcock from Cincinnati. Joe Adcock, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and don't Johnny forget Logan and Del Crandall. Joe Torrey's brother Frank to yeah. to platoon yep. with Adcock, That's and right. Del Rice backing up Del right. Crandall. Sure. Del they Crandall, were as right. deep as any team uh, that we followed in in the fifties and early sixties. Right. They were terrific. The, um, and they could party too. And Johnny Logan and Eddie Matthews, oh boy, they were out at the bars every night. It was unbelievable. It was all awesome. can't mention. You can't I mention 1957 without house. Hurricane Hazel. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Who put together a year of? They had not, a year, two months. He's the biggest one of the biggest flashes in the pan in history. Yeah. Right. 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 Um. And uh, it was let's not forget yeah. Felix Mantia, Mantia a right. terrific utility infielder. Utility infielder. And right. when it came time to play in every day for the Mets, who drafted him, um, he was a disaster. He was. Yeah. He just. Uh, he was a great utility player, though. But a great yes, and my favorite was Johnny Logan, the shortstop, yeah. was a New Yorker, the and. and um, he was, he was a piece of work, yeah. Terrific. Uh, you want to know how, how they wound up there? Can I uh, do a please. little bit on that? Please, if you will. Okay. Uh, in 1952, uh, they, uh, in Boston, because they had been, even though they won the pennant in 1948, they had been set, second fiddle to the Red Sox for years. So in 1952, they drew, uh, they finished in seventh. And they drew a whopping uh, total of 281,000 fans. And they owned the uh, Milwaukee franchise in the American Association. So Bill Vec was looking uh, after 1952 to move the St. Louis Browns uh, into Milwaukee, where he had previously been successful as a minor league owner. The American League turned him down, and then Perini, uh, Lou Perini, who owned the Braves at the Lou time, Perini, right. uh, Decided that uh, you know they, they're just building a new stadium there. County they played an old the A18 played an old ballpark by the name of Borchard Field, and they spent uh, you know a lot of the money building this new county stadium. And about two weeks uh, before the reg, two or three weeks before the regular season opened, they uh, they got permission from the National League to move the uh, uh, team to uh, from Boston to Milwaukee. In fact, uh, you know, 1953, Joe Whitecock card, Bowman Joe Whitecock card has him as a Milwaukee Brave, and, uh, Boston Brave, I'm sorry, with the B cap on. Right. Uh, taken in spring training, and uh, he never played one inning for the uh, 
you know, Boston Brave. She came over in the, you know, that winter. But that, that's how they wound up in Milwaukee, and, you know, they drew two million, and, uh, a million eight the first year, and I think two million the second well, year. Well, they were crazy there. They, they yeah. loved the Braves. Milwaukee fans went crazy for them. And understand, too, yeah. that that was the reason. Their success in Milwaukee was the reason that Walter O'Malley very well knew that if he moved to Los Angeles that he would have be a huge success. And, right. and Stoneham went along with, with O'Malley to San Francisco. But it was O'Malley who saw the success of the Braves in Milwaukee that further pushed him to take the team to Los Angeles. Sure. Whoa. And here's a little something interesting. The Giants were on their way to uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. To Minneapolis. Right. Uh, right. And so Stoneham came along. And Stoneham could not have made the move to the West Coast without – or uh, O'Malley could not have made the move to the West Coast without Stoneham because right. National League teams would come out and it wouldn't be profitable for uh, to hit the coast for a one-stop thing. Mm-hmm. So making the Giants uh, the Northern California uh, team uh, made it easy for um, – a team to come in and go down the coast and play play another series. You know, the American League <laughs> did that for seven years before the A's moved from Kansas City to Oakland. Yeah. The I Angels had a conversation. Team out there. I had a conversation with Stone about about leaving New York. And wow. it was clear that he was going to Minneapolis because it was uh, – because – because uh, Harlem was becoming blacker and blacker, and he wanted an area that was whiter and whiter, and Minneapolis mm-hmm. certainly filled that bill. And I asked him, I said, well, when, when O'Malley called you to say he was going to Los Angeles, did you sort of balance uh, between Minneapolis and San Francisco? And basically, Stoneham was, it was kind of weird. Stoneham said, well, it really didn't matter to me, you know, which of the ones I went to. You know, I really didn't care. I said he said he said it made sense to go with O'Malley because we would continue our you know our feud there, the Dodgers and the and the Giants on the East Coast. Yeah, the rivalry. He said, yeah, it, it, right, he said right. it just made sense. But I think the fact was that he really, more than anything else, just wanted to get out of get out of Harlem. Mm-hmm. You know, and, well, and and so wherever whichever one of the two that he went to, he didn't he didn't seem to to care. Wow. This is my age-old question, and I have three experts to ask it to. Did O'Malley hold the fact, hold it over Stoneham, that he had territorial rights in St. Paul, where they had a Triple A ball club? Uh, did the Dodgers? Did he hold it over Stoneham's head, and was that the reason? Um, that he brought him with him? I, I, I would say no. I, I, I would, would say no, no also. Yeah. I would say no. Okay. I, I would say that Stoneham, would balanced, say that Stoneham balanced whether to stay, to go to Minneapolis by himself against right. continuing that, uh, that, that rivalry on the West Coast. That Stoneham decided that doing that made much more financial sense Sure. Also, sure. the fact that San Francisco was, a, and you know, San Francisco, Oakland was a, a virgin territory, and they had a lot of people there. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I don't, I don't think O'Malley was holding anything over over Stoneham's head there. I think Stoneham decided, you know, O'Malley's going. If O'Malley wants to go to to Los Angeles, it would make sense for me to go with him. Okay. I heard a story. You guys could tell me it was true. But I'm really told Stoneham, you go to California, and you can either go to L.A. or San Francisco. Your choice. And I'll take no. the other city. No. No. I, no. Absolutely, Absolutely not. not. Absolutely not. never happened. Absolutely not. Never happened. No. Okay. O'Malley no. had been negotiating with, with Los the Los Angeles people. Since they were giving the him downtown Series. property. Yeah. Since the World Series, I think, of 56. Either 55 or 56. Los right, Angeles was right. not was not something that was arbitrary to O'Malley. Okay. O'Malley okay. was planning to go there. Uh, huh. 
You know, it's interesting. What, what's so interesting is, is, is it's the old argument as to whether, uh, uh, you know, whether it was O'Malley was the bad guy or whether Robert uh, Moses, Moses was the bad guy. Yeah. You know, who was the bad guy? Um, you know, clearly Moses was a bad guy, but certainly O'Malley was also a bad guy. A bad guy, uh, right. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, for the Brooklyn fans at any rate, he was, in fact, the devil. Uh, right, right. It's hard, hard to imagine because you talk to these Brooklyn, you know, former Brooklyn fans, people who were, you know, 9, 10, and 11 years old rooting for the Brooklyn Dodgers, in 1954, 55, 56, and then to all of a sudden read in the paper that their beloved team, I mean, when they were called bums, they were called bums with right. love. I mean, they adored right. these people. They adored That's Gil right. Hodges. When Gil Hodges sure. wasn't hitting during the 1963 World Series, all the Brooklyn fans went to church to pray for him. Right. That's right. Exactly. I mean... I mean, you don't see that. That's not. The it was a community see. that they, they lived in the community. It was. He did. It was, he did. It was like a family affair. It was a family uh, affair. These the these players, players would make a special prayer for him. It wasn't just the fans praying. It oh, was, I know. Right. Sure. It, the priest would, you know, this is for our our gill, uh, you know, like right. God's God's watching down and no, he's no got a pitch cap thing going. Right. And, <laughs> Right, and so um, so really, when when O'Malley took that team away from those people, I mean, it really, really, truly broke really, their heart. Right, it did. Really still does. Broke their heart. I mean, you you uh, still does. I talk to people today that are, they're still they, they hate it. They hate O'Malley. Absolutely. Uh, this uh, some gave up base. They cut their yeah. nose off to spite their face. They gave up right. the game, the sport they loved. And yep. never went to another game. So, well, so. because they couldn't root for the Yankees. You can't root for the Yankees. They hated the right. Yankees. I know, yeah. It's 60 years Which, ago, and they're still holding this uh, grudge. Well, without a doubt. Which brings this, this around. In 1957, when the Giants yep. and Dodgers left, yep. it was Milwaukee who won the pennant. And I'm 10. Right. And... I couldn't, as Peter said, you can't root for the Yankees if you're a National Leaguer. <laughs> it took me right. years to accept the fact that I really loved the team, <laughs> the memory of, of the the Yankees and the, the players and what have you. Part of it was through our our show, Peter. You, um, it's rubbing off a little bit. <laughs> but but um, for, as a 10-year-old, you couldn't couldn't root for the Yankees. They're playing the Braves in the World Series, right. and we Giant and Dodger fans were National League fans. Right. Back then, the, the two leagues were in rivalry with each other, not just really? cursory. Well, were, yeah, um, there, are pe- there are people that say the Braves should have won four. They should have won in 1956 when they lost by a game to the Dodgers. And then 1959, uh, because Red Sandy missed that season because of the had tuberculosis, and they used seven players to, uh, to try to replace them at second base, all of whom were inept. They wound up losing a two-game uh, best-of-three uh, series playoff to the L.A. Dodgers in two straight. Yeah. And it took right. the Dodgers 65 years to win a World Series in Brooklyn and two years to win a World Series in Los Angeles. It's very, very true. In the 1957 World Series, there was one superstar, one pitcher, who won three of the games, and that was Lou Burdett. He Lou won Burdett. three games. He had an ERA of 0.67. Uh, yeah. The guy was absolutely unbelievable. He won. And the Yankees beat him in Game Five and Game Seven the next year. Yeah, the next. Yeah. Well, that, that, yeah. that may have been the difference, but in '57, at any rate, yeah, uh, uh, Burdett. He won game two, four to two. Uh, Burdett beat Whitey Ford in one of the classic, classic games. In game five, he beat him one to nothing. Yeah, I remember amazing, listening amazing to amazing ball game. I was listening to that on the radio. I was, I was ridden uh, with Asian flu. I was, I was so weak I couldn't get out of bed. Yeah. I listened to that on the radio, and uh, Jerry Coleman did not charge a ground ball. Uh, which, uh, you know, let the run come in uh, that Whitey Ford gave up, and it was one nothing, you know, as you just said. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then the Kubek made an error in the game seven, which blew that yeah. one open. Right. And they and won that, that game five, five nothing. nothing. That yeah. was a five nothing ball game. Yeah. yeah. And I went to two of those World Series games in Milwaukee in 57. Wow. Oh, and the, the sidebar was that Tony Kubek, who had two home uh-huh. runs in the game three there, was uh, from Milwaukee. Yeah. Was he booed? Right. Uh, yeah. They booed yeah. Kubek cool, cool even though he was a hometown. Uh... Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because he was a Yankee. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, and I remember Casey. Casey really um, disparaging Milwaukee and calling them yeah. Bush. And this yeah, oh yeah. Bush. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And here the Braves beat them. It was so wonderful. Milwaukee went crazy. You know, it was, the Braves were more impo- more popular than the Packers. You know that? Packers really were terrible were. back then. <laughs> yeah, well, they the were Packers, more popular. The Packers were not yet the Packers. That was a pre Lombardi days. Yeah, the <laughs> Packers would be the Packers. You know, it would take a while for the Packers to be yeah. the Packers. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. I want to bring up the analogy of a successful Brooklyn Dodger franchise making money in Brooklyn hand over fist, moving to L.A., and then a successful franchise in Milwaukee – who drew all those fans with the rage of the town, they end up moving to Atlanta. How, did, right. how does it come to be that um, that happened? Well, well, I think one of the things that happened was uh, uh, that Milwaukee had a fairly substantial TV market, and that was cut off when the uh, Twins came to Minnesota. And uh, when Perini and company decided to sell the team, they sold it to a group that was, from day one, you know, looking to move them out. Right, right. And uh, they, they, in fact, after Fred Haney left, uh, the next three managers they had were all re- retreads. They were, uh, a, it was, I'm not, not necessarily a sort of Charlie Dressen, Bertie Tebbets, and Bobby Bragan. All of them. They're my favorites. Yeah, three, three who yeah. were, uh, you know, yeah. didn't. Uh, Let's say not too uh, well accomplished in the, with other ball clubs, and uh, yeah, they they, they the, the National League decided to uh, shaft Milwaukee on the expansion in 1969 because Milwaukee had the temerity to hold the Braves to the last year of the lease in 1965, and they drew about right. uh, 480 thousand something <laughs> like that. But was, then, uh, hey, yeah. let's talk about Bo- the Bobby Bregan connection with the Dodgers. He came up with the right. Dodgers, and um, he was one of those allegedly. No, allegedly. He signed. He oh. signed. He, he told signed me, that. He thing. signed that thing. And and he, he told me. Bregan. Let me tell you about Bregan. Let me tell you about okay. Bregan. He signed the petition saying that we don't want Jackie Robinson to play. I think Reagan was from Texas, if I'm not mistaken. So, More down there, yeah. So uh, Branch Rickey calls him in. And, and what he ends up doing is he ends up sending Reagan down to the minors where he ends up becoming a manager. And he told me that because of Rickey, he became much – I mean, I mean, he turned. I mean, he stopped being a prejudiced, racist guy and started to work with the African-American players under his care. And he said that, that Branch Rickey was the most important person in his life in turning around his prejudice and making him a better person, which was neat. Something. Yeah. Neat. It's really and w- one of those players he worked with was Maury Wills, who was Absolutely. nine right. years in the minors. Yeah. Yep. And um, I think it was he was with Montreal. Bregan was the manager there. Right, right. Oh, that was the, they were out in the Coast League. Oh, okay. okay. It wasn't Montreal. It was, uh, Sp- I think it was Spokane. Spokane? Spokane. Yeah. They had Spokane, yeah. 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 Well, um, whatever it was, he made him into a switch hitter told them that right. if he's going to make the majors, he's got to get on. And if you get on, it's a double, basically, with your, your speed. And yeah. um, So uh, he t- his initial prejudice where he was going to care enough about his hatred 
to prevent another human being from playing, turn, mm-hmm. he turns his life around, basically, and really did. Yeah. culminates by being a, a, um, a teacher and a, and a mentor to African-American players. That um, mm-hmm. I think that's a beautiful story. To, to it is. About really is. It, it, it really is. It really is. Yeah. No, it was, it was interesting to talk about it. Bragan, Bragan was almost embarrassed at who mm-hmm. he had been. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And he said, he said well, that, that, really that Ricky, too, didn't you know, Ricky said, you know, you you want me to get rid of you? I can certainly get rid of you, but <laughs> you have this in you to be both a manager and a better person. And you know, why don't you go down to? Uh, um, Fort Worth, and managed down there, and, uh, you know, he did. Yeah, he I read that. Uh, and, and he got a big league managership. For, for ultimately, that. he did, yeah. I read that Satchel Page had the same kind of effect on uh, uh, Southern-born players when he was with the Indians and with the Browns. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Really yeah. It does go to show you, and I'm thinking in terms of my boyhood hero, uh, Alvin Dark, he went through the same era and was exposed to the same prejudices as a kid and built into you as a southerner and whatever. He didn't react that way in life. He, he, didn't, um, he didn't become a social progressive. Alvin Dark was a racist bastard his whole life. He was a racist bastard, right. He was he's an evangel- evangelical. He was. He was. Yeah. He was a bad, bad guy. Bad Alvin guy. Dark was a bad. Yeah, it wasn't guy. just blacks. It was Spanish people. I That's remember. That's right. Anybody. That's right. Uh, Cepeda. Heck, he used to tell me about 120 it. 120 runs, and the dog comes up with some sort of rating system of when the runs were knocked in. Knocks in 120 runs for crying out loud, and Dark is downing him and trying. Trying to break his spirit, he was a yeah, real. Well, Ralph, if you if yeah, you ask, uh, used to tell me what a bastard he was. If you ask Nancy Finley about when Alvin Dark managed the Oakland A's, I've read in several sources that uh, when they, you know they brought him in to replace Dick Williams after 1973, that the A's players uh, uh, decided not to pay attention to him. Right, huh. that's but Brando was, and a couple Kyle of the others. Brando who said, "Yeah, run, run the team." Talk. Yeah. This guy no, they, couldn't manage a meat market. That's what he said. <laughs> the other, it's interesting, the other really bad racist who was around a long, long time was Joe Cronin. Joe oh, yeah. Cronin. Oh, yeah. As both, as both the shortstop for the Red Sox and the general right. manager for the Red Sox. Cronin, Terrible. as the general manager, would not bring up the Italian right. kids. Right. They had a oh, third really? baseman. They had a third baseman in the minors who was who was just, you know, fabulous. Mm-hmm. Um, because with him. Frank uh, Malzone. Frank Malzone. Yeah. Right. Malzone, Malzone, Malzone as much as told me that that's that, that, that son of a bitch Cronin kept me in the minors. It wouldn't bring me up. Right. Huh. So uh, those, Howard Bryan brought a book several years ago about the institutional racism uh, yes. Between the uh, Cronin, uh, Eddie Collins, Higgins, right. Mike Higgins, the manager in New York, yep. Yep, that's who exactly was too, right. too, too south to, to care mm-hmm. most of the yeah. time. Yeah. You know, another guy. How many of those water. guys are in the Hall of Fame and Marvin Miller isn't? It's not. Yeah. Well, that's well, New is one of my pet peeves. I, 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 I couldn't understand how they put him in, in the first place, and I still can't understand. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like the football uh, the whole thing with Jerry Jones. There's certain things you can't understand. Well, well you can understand um, it because it was a good old boys network. That's right. Remember, the fans right. are made up of these racist, uh, racist people, too. Look, it took forever uh, to put uh, Jacob Rupert in there, who owned the Yankees, you know, made the Yankees into what they, uh, the owner made the Yankees into what they became. Took them forever, and Yorkie they put in probably because he uh, either he probably con- contributed a lot of money. Well, he did. It's the only thing I can un- I can understand. Well, he was very he, he was had very that popular Jimmy owner. Fun. Mm. Yeah, he the had Jimmy that fun. Jimmy yeah. fun. That he Jim was a very Williams popular owner. Bought yeah. into. And all of Jacob Rupert's fans were dead. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Yeah. 
Amazing. Yeah, I know. He, he well, was slaughtered, um, son of a bitch, too. He was slaughtered. He was bad. Yeah. Was um, well, you know, slaughter was your basic southerner. Yep. He was your, he was your basic southerner. Right. Um, my guess is that as the years went on, he became less and less a son of a bitch. Right. And I, By the I way, Peter, I uh, interviewed him for my for my. Uh, he spiked. He spiked at Jackie a couple times. You know, the funny thing is, he swore to me. He swore to me that he didn't do that on purpose. He swore I didn't do that on purpose. Isn't that funny? Peter, I'm rereading Jackie the bombs. Him. Couldn't stand him. Couldn't stand him. Yeah. Peter, no, I'm rereading bombs. I'm uh-huh. about a third of the way through. It's the first time in uh, quite a number of years. Yeah. Yeah, because of all the discussions we've had. And, sure. Uh, yeah. Sure, those guys come alive. It's really cool. Oh, yeah. Marvelous. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, speaking of guys uh, coming alive, next week we're going to talk about your terrific book, Peter. I think uh, next week I'm going to be not here. Next oh, okay. week I'm going to be somewhere else. Well, Christmas if it's falls in the forest. Christmas kind of next week. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yes. We'll do it the week after. Okay, Barry. Hey, guys, All right, everybody have terrific. a wonderful Christmas, great Hanukkah, fabulous. Happy holidays. Happy New Year's holiday. Uh, same to you. And, Ron, it's right. great to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Ronnie, wonderful to hear you again. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Um, Take care. Warms to kiss kiss, <laughs> Ronnie. Well, thank you, buddy. All right. Sweet Love you. Thank you, Al, for everything. And Peter, You're welcome. It's, it's terrific. Have a wonderful holiday. We'll be back two weeks from now with the Golenbach Show. And if you like our offerings, I implore you to um, box up some lightly used children's books and take them down to the Head Start program in whatever community you live in. You can get kids reading and school ready, and that would be terrific. Um, have a happy holiday if uh, you don't hear us between now and then. And uh, adios, everybody. Thank you again. Good night. Bye-bye.